Amen. Wow, I don't know about you, but I love singing Christmas carols. I love this time of year. I'm Pastor Ruben Shring. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Church, and I don't know about you, you folks online, but can you feel it? Can you feel Christmas in the air? There's a lot that goes around this season, isn't there? And probably the most important thing yet <laughs> in this season that happens is certainly for kids, right? Uh, but especially those of you who are Christ followers is the momentum that builds up leading towards Christmas. And starting in the fourth century AD, Christians would celebrate the weeks that led up to Christmas. We know this waiting process as Advent, and we've been celebrating this this entire month. You know, you, you know we're in this Advent series, and what I want you to understand is Advent means the coming. It's all about the coming of Christ, and with the coming, really, it means it's all about the waiting, isn't it? The waiting of Jesus, and in this Christmas season, we find ourselves in this period that we don't like, at least. I guess I'll speak for myself. I don't like. I don't like the waiting. <laughs> I don't like to wait. I want you to take yourself back, you know, however long you need to do this, right, to as a kid, and remember going to bed that night before Santa came or whatever you know, tradition you held at Christmas, that was mine. And your parents, you know, probably spinning some tale to some degree that if you don't go to bed, Santa won't come, right? And you find yourself in that bed, eyes wide open, right? You cannot get to sleep because what are you doing? You're waiting. You're waiting. And unless <laughs> you are one of those people that don't use Amazon Prime, which by the way, has that made Christmas shopping so much easier? Especially when, uh, if you're anything like me, I have family that extends from Alaska to Alabama. And so not only did Amazon Prime help me ship gifts, it helped me not have to wrap them as well. It was amazing. I love Amazon Prime. But, but if you, maybe you're one of those people who still likes to go out, get the gifts, and, and so you're the only one who doesn't hate the waiting. Everyone else, guess what? We hate the waiting. And this distaste for waiting is, is a bigger issue than, than sometimes we realize, and, and, and the huge implica implications it has on our life. And so in this Christmas season of waiting, I want to dig into what this waiting's mean and, and how we should respond. And that brings us to our big idea for today, and it, it's this. And, and I want you to listen real carefully, okay? Your response to waiting reveals where your trust and hope really dwell. Let me say it again. Your response to waiting reveals where your trust and hope really dwell. And we're going to look at this in three different ways. We're going to look at, number one, how we typically wait. You probably already see where that's going, right? How we should wait. You probably already see that one too. And then lastly, how we are still waiting, but we are waiting in confident hope. So let's look at that first one, how we typically wait. And I want to start long before the birth of Christ. I want to go way back to the Old Testament. And the prophet Isaiah is actually giving instructions to some of his people, and they are an impatient people. They are a people who are outright disobeying God. And so as a sign of how God would one day provide a way to solve this problem of their sin, he speaks through Isaiah and unveils a clue to the birth of Christ. And he says this in Isaiah 7, 13 and 14. And Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David, is it not enough to try the impatience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel, which as many of you know means God with us. Now, this is one of Isaiah's prophecies that was not fulfilled, listen to this, for over 700 years. Talk about waiting. That's a long time to wait. And, and if you spend much time reading about Isaiah's audience, the, the Israelites, right, we understand how bad 
they were at waiting. Or maybe even we understand how they're a lot like us when it comes to waiting. I think of a couple of <laughs> examples here in Genesis chapter 16. We find Abraham, and he's told he's going to have a son, but he's got to wait. Abraham gets tired of waiting and uh, has a conflict that lasts for years, thousands of years to this day. Exodus 32, Moses goes up into the mount to speak with God for 40 days, and the people get tired of waiting, and they build a golden calf. 1 Samuel chapter 8, God's people, they want to be ruled not by God anymore, but by a king like everyone else. 1 Samuel chapter 13, the king now is there, and he too is tired of waiting on God and offers up a sacrifice that is unbecoming. Now, here's the thing. Again, I think sometimes we look at these examples. I know I do, especially the Moses one, right? I think, how stupid can these people be? What, you know, I say this to my knuckleheads, right? How are these? Obviously, we've got to be better than them, but are we? Are we? Or are our struggles very similar? Do we wait the same way? Aren't we continuously stuck on ourselves, listen to this, and focused on getting our own way in our own time? The unfortunate truth is (laughs) we are very impatient and prideful people. Hopefully you and I have been able to learn from these mistakes of the people in in the Old Testament, but it's still likely we struggle with patience and waiting on God's timing. But remember, your response to waiting reveals where your trust and hope really dwell. And I want you to think about it, right? Think about yourself when you have to wait, even for a minute, how do you respond and, and, and I even think this way too, how our impatience grows exponentially very quickly, right? I can even think back to um, my time in, in college where the internet was just first becoming a thing and we had this crazy thing called dial-up. Now that I look back at it, it, it was one of the worst things on the face of the earth because it started you know, with this call that was made through your computer and it would make these noises that are unbecoming to anyone. You know? and, and, and it would take forever. Now, if that little wheel of death pops up on my phone, I find myself screaming, come on, what's going on? My kids, the same thing. Someone cuts me off, right? Come on. I'm so impatient. I want people to get out of my way. How about how we respond to a pandemic in our lives and maybe the abnormal effects it tends to have on how we live? The book of Proverbs speaks to this struggle directly. In chapter 14, it says this, verse 29, patience leads to abundant understanding. Listen, but impatience leads to stupid mistakes. Stupid mistakes. When we glance through the accounts that I just listed, right, the people in the Old Testament, we see that their impatience led to massive problems, huge failures, huge loss of life. We look at Abraham by not waiting. Him and his wife's servant had a son and created a world war that exists to this day. Moses, the people disobeyed and they built this golden calf and it caused more than 3,000 people to lose their lives and not see the promised land. Israel embraced Saul as their king and lost thousands to war and people turning from God and Saul himself chose to cut God out and he lost his crown. And in the process, his own and his son's life. We are inherently impatient people. And the end result of our impatience is always (laughs) the pain of stupid mistakes. And this is why God is so intentional. Listen, 
so intentional with this process of waiting. And this is not just about waiting for things. Listen to this, people. Not waiting for things, but the process of waiting for Jesus. Our waiting is just not a personal struggle of our will. It is truly a spiritual battle in which we are waiting on God. And remember, your response to waiting reveals where your trust and hope really dwell. So we looked at Israel and how, honestly, we see ourselves in that picture, how we typically wait. How should we wait? And I want to look at this, and I want to start with a, a quote of one of my favorite theologians, a German theologian and, and philosopher, and he did so many things. Many of you know his name, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Yeah, you know, he was a, a guy who opposed Adolf Hitler's regime. But he was talking about Advent, and he said it this way. He said, celebrating Advent means learning how to wait. And waiting is an art which our impatient age has forgotten. Wow, that's so true. We want to pluck the fruit before it has had time to ripen. Greedy eyes are soon disappointed when what they saw as luscious fruit is sour to the taste. In disappointment and disgust, they throw it away. The fruit, full of promise, rots on the ground, and it is rejected without thanks by disappointing hands. Isn't that powerful? Have you ever eaten a piece of fruit that wasn't quite ripe, right? You get the picture of that, and it's disgusting. You throw it out. But oftentimes, that came with impatience, and it led to the frustration of bitterness, not just in the fruit, but maybe even in the moment, all as a result of not waiting. It's a painful path that we've taken. And unfortunately, it tends to look like this. And if you look at this graph, uh, I think this exudes so many things perfectly, like that, that, that we need to look at. When we're impatient, watch this. It, it, it takes this progression. When it starts there, it leads to pride. That pride then embodies and builds and grows, and it leads to emptiness. And that gives birth to the last thing, bitterness. And unfortunately, as a pastor, I've had a front row seat to bitterness for some 20 years. And listen, while God can overcome anything, bitterness is one of those things, man, that takes a stronghold. The enemy utilizes it in people's lives, and it's destructive and dangerous, all as a result of our impatience. However, how we should think, right? When we think patiently, when we think in God's timing, our patience leads to a word we don't like to use in our society, right? It leads to humility, a humble spirit. And listen, that humble spirit always leads to another word that is often <laughs> unheard of in our society, fulfillment. I feel fulfilled. And that fulfillment then itself gives birth to the last thing, not bitterness, but joy. Joy in the Lord. And this cycle is constant, but when we wait on God and when we put our trust in Him, we follow His timing. It leads to this place of joy. So let's bring this back to Christmas, shall we? Well, there are lots of accounts in humanity that shows us our impatience. I want to look in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2 and see where a man's patience led to absolute outright joy. A man many of you may have never heard of. His name's Simeon. Luke chapter 2 verse 25 says this, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. And it had been revealed uh, to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah, moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for them what the custom of the law required, look at this, Simeon took him in his arms and he praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, 
as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. In those days, Simeon had been waiting patiently to meet Jesus. With the same anticipation that we wait for Christmas now. And in his waiting, listen, he was rewarded. When he got to hold Jesus in his arms, and if you've held a baby, maybe it's your own child, you know the blessing that that is just in general. But can you imagine holding the Lord? The big difference in Simeon's waiting and ours is this, oftentimes. Simeon's waiting was something that honored God and led to fulfillment. How did that happen? Simeon's focus was not on himself. Simeon's focus was on waiting for Jesus in humility. He soaked it up. And just like Simeon, when we soak up this anticipation leading to meeting Jesus, we have this same opportunity in our waiting to be humble, to be fulfilled, and through that, be joyful. And as Christmas gets closer, we're all waiting for something, right? Maybe you're waiting to be with family or for family to come. Maybe you're waiting uh, on a job offer, especially in this tenuous time. Uh, maybe, Maybe you're waiting for a COVID test result. Maybe you're a college student and you're waiting on grades for the semester or if you're going to get in. Maybe you're a young person, old person, and you're just waiting on a gift. But our waiting should be focused, listen, not on those things, but remembering that our celebration is not about those things. And I'm not saying discredit those things, but that's not what Advent is about. The Advent is about waiting on the coming Messiah. And let me tell you something. It's worth waiting for, right? I had a COVID test a couple weeks ago. I've forgotten about it. I've received gifts. Guess what? I've forgotten about those. I've gotten jobs or waited on jobs. That time, that season is over. We can't forget about Jesus. We can't. And remember, our response to waiting reveals where our trust and hope really dwell. And so we've talked about how we typically wait. We've talked about how we should wait. And and then I want us to understand that, that we're still waiting. In fact, I would even suggest this, we're waiting in confident hope. Because while, yes, we're talking about Christmas and the coming Messiah, right? There is a second part to Advent, post Jesus' birth. We're waiting for the Advent. Remember, the coming of the return of Christ. He's coming back. And that should draw us closer to him as we aim, right, our focus to become more like him. Humility, fulfillment, joy, all derived from patience. And as we focus, listen, we wait for him more authentically, don't we? The song we sang earlier, uh, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, was written from the perspective of the nation of Israel, right? Waiting longingly for the Messiah to come and save them. Their history was full of pain and persecution in some ways because of their disobedience towards God, yet they held to the promise that one day the Savior would come. I want to read through some of those lyrics, and I want you to feel that. I want you to get it in your head of the way they were longing. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, 
rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou rod of Jesse, free thy own from Satan's tyranny. From depths of hell thy people save and give them victory over the grave. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to flight. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou key of David, come and open wide our heavenly home. Make safe the way that leads on high and close the path to misery. Listen, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee. O Israel, place yourself in Israel those many years ago. Can you feel it? This song was born out of the original Advent celebration. It speaks to the longing to be ransomed out of captivity, right? It begs for a joyful conclusion to a meager existence. It echoes the cries of the heart that yearns for heaven, but is still unfortunately contained here on earth. Does this longing, when you sing it, when you hear the words proclaimed, does it ring a bell? Does it sound familiar? I'm not sure about you, but I long to be rid of this body and all its fallibilities. I long to be rid of sin and my inclinations. I long to be rid of this pandemic. And I long to be rid of this human disunity and suffering. Paul writes to Titus with this same longing in chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly possessions and passions, to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. Listen, while we wait for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's coming back. We wait. And this Christmas, as we look back and celebrate the fact that Jesus answered the call to obey God and come to earth as as a baby, as we exchange gifts to remember that he himself is the greatest gift of all time, Let us also focus our hearts on the new advent. That the promise God delivered to humanity in the manger is yet to be fully revealed. At Christmas, we celebrate, but we just get a peek into the box, right? But when Jesus returns, we get to unwrap the whole shebang. And so we wait. And our response to waiting reveals where our trust and hope really dwell. So how do you wait? Where does your trust and hope dwell? Do you wait typically? Do you wait impatiently and pridefully? Do you find yourself bitter? Or do you wait patiently? And you are fulfilled. And people, when they know you, they know the meaning of joy, not because of you, but because of the coming king that shines through you. How you wait (laughs) reveals your trust and hope and where they really dwell. Where are you at this Advent season? I pray that you're fulfilled and full of joy. Amen. Heavenly Father God, I thank you for who you are. God, you are a good Lord. Thank you for sending your son in that first Advent season to come as a baby, incarnate. 
Christ, to live as a man, a human, to step off that throne, Father, and to give your life, to bear our sin on that tree and to be raised to new life again. Lord, we relish in that. But Father, we also beg for your coming again where you will come with the trump at the sound and the dead in Christ will rise first. Father, I pray that through that moment we wait well. And in that waiting, Father, we are preparing for your coming. And in that preparation, our thought in our waiting is to tell others about you. Passionately, boldly, Father, during this time, let us not forget. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I just want to thank you all for joining us today online. And what a blessing it is to be able to worship this way in this time. We pray that you're safe. We pray that you are healthy. But most of all, I pray that you are fulfilled. Patiently, right? And full of joy. Will you end with me today as I give the benediction? <clears throat> and I'm going to end today as I began with Isaiah chapter 7 because this is what Advent, original Advent, is all about. Therefore, the Lord will give himself a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and she will bear a son and you will call his name Emmanuel. God is with us. God came. Grace. And God is coming again. Let us praise him. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. Before you go, I have some quick updates for you. So Christmas Eve services, we're going to have seven in total, and I'll put the times right up here. Be sure to make a reservation for that, and the Christmas Eve service will be online at 1 p.m., so be sure to check that out as well. And youth ministries, that will be starting back up on Sunday, January 10th, so be sure to join for that. And we will be live streaming um, Sunday services for December 27th and January the 3rd, and that will be at 9 a.m. And for everything else that's going on, please check out the Times of Grace, our app, and our website. Have a blessed weekend.